Hey there, Sir Nerds, Trace here, and I am one of you. A few weeks back, I made a set of short documentaries about the ongoings and goings-on at the European Organization for Nuclear Research while they're on their long shutdown too. You probably remember them, but if not, there are links in the description to watch them both. I think they're both fantastic. They're like my children, I don't have a favorite. But outside of the physical physics phenomena refurbishment being finagled at this festival of quantum familiarization, these humans are also experts at what they do. And as such, they have a lot of interesting knowledge stored inside of their meat jelly brains. I asked after I made those two first episodes if people out there wanted more, and y'all said yes, so here we are. Here's a bit more about what their work is really like at CERN. Ooh, okay, so accelerator physics, what exactly do you do, say, day to day? So um, we do the studies to make sure that the machine is running smoothly, but also to try to make it run better. So like with the simulations uh, of the particles, we have simulated the whole machine with all of the magnets, and then we see all of the different effects that the protons have among each other, and we try just to optimize the machine as much as we can. Okay, so Andrea, she's like a mechanic. Accelerator physicists build particle accelerators and maintain them optimally. This is what they do, which means when we're talking about making beam, that is like all Andrea thinks about all day at work every day, making a stable, usable beam, which ain't easy. Her job is to make sure the 2,556 bunches of protons that create the beam are consistent, because if they're not, the science isn't solid. Imagine trying to run an experiment and the beam inconsistent, or it moves around, or it doesn't collide as often, as you needed to in order to get the data that you're looking for. That would be bad. So, let's make it good. Physicists like her have to make sure a superconducting super collider so large that it spans two countries does its job flawlessly, which is hard because it was built by humans. And I don't know if you noticed, we ain't perfect. Um, I can tell you something that I find pretty cool. Yeah. So when I was working in operations, one of my main jobs was to measure the machine resonances. So what are resonances? This is a very cool concept. When I learned it, I really liked it. A bunch of protons, when they travel around the machine, I'm sure that everybody pictures it going just like this. Mm -hmm. But it oscillates. Mm -hmm. So it oscillates in the, in the horizontal plane and in the vertical plane mm -hmm. all the time. And uh, the number of oscillations, we call it the tune. That's a technicality. Um, the thing is that the machine, um, it has magnets, and these magnets are not perfect just because we cannot build perfect things. They have magnet imperfections. And this means that sometimes there's a little error. For example, you have an integer tune, which means imagine that the bunch it starts here, goes around the ring, and it does, let's say, 10 oscillations. If it's exactly 10 and there are errors in the machine, instead of uh, finishing at the point at zero, let's say, it will be up. A little bit up and if it does this a million times these imperfections are going to accumulate and then at some point we're going to lose the beam. The LHC has resonance. That's amazing right? That sounds like something out of a Dan Brown novel. It's not nefarious it's just a science problem that needs to be solved. But what we can do is put correctors on. So let's say this magnet that gives us this imperfection then we're going to put this other magnet that's going to compensate for it. When it's running the LHC is flooded with super stable helium and the magnets are cooled to 1.9 Kelvin colder than the temperature of outer space. The coldest place in the known universe. The coldest. This makes the magnets super conducting, but again, they're handmade. I visited the magnet factory on the CERN campus because nothing in the world is perfect. So in the end, what we do, uh, it's like we change the tune. So the number of oscillations of the beam, because this can be changed with the magnet, the mm -hmm. magnet strengths and the magnet fields. Right. And we test all of the different combinations of tunes and then we see when, where we lose it. Yeah. And this gives us a map of how our magnets in the machine are. A team of CERN physicists had to make a resonance map of the magnetic fields inside of the LHC so that the beam wouldn't crash out of the machine due to the tiny flaws in the magnets, which would create the resonance and that would be bad because that's expensive. I don't know, it's bad. Just trust it's bad. Yeah. And this is, for example, what accelerator physicists do. If we don't do this, we lose the beam. We yeah. cannot operate. Wow. And it's very difficult. Like, we, it's super difficult to make this beam stable. Like, if everything is not tuned to perfection, like, we lose it. Yeah. Like, even like in the LHC to ramp it up. And in order to not lose it due to instabilities, we have to pump up our octopoles maximum. So it's like, it's highly unstable. Yeah. <laughs> But that's awesome. <laughs> but we make it work. It's super yeah. cool. Oh, 
gosh, so cool. I love learning new things about stuff. So I was so lucky to get to visit CERN, but I'd love to visit more places, and to do that, I need your help. Click the subscribe button, tell someone about the channel. I can't grow this thing without you and other great nerds like you. We're all in this together, so thanks. Okay. Another story. Even though we colloquially call these things massive, you know, machines, <laughs> we call them that, but we also call them atom smashers or even hadron colliders, but they don't actually collide or smash anything. It still seems like brute force. Smash stuff together and see what comes out. The beauty of it is that we've gotten really, really more and more precise. So us, uh, sort of cro magnons smashing things together, that's us, the experimentalists. We're still, <laughs> we smash the things. In fact, particles don't ever, ever collide. When you smash things together, you have a picture in your mind, a car and all the parts falling out. Right. In fact, it's not really like you're taking a proton, another proton, and you're smashing them apart into their components. It's actually just that the components of those particles got close enough to each other at a high enough energy that they interacted. It's not really a collision. What you're doing is you're taking a whole bunch, and, and to give you an idea, we have a hundred billion protons here, and a hundred billion protons here, and we bring them through each other. We do this 40 million times a second. Okay, let's just look at one of these. Hundred billion, hundred billion, just like Andromeda and the Milky Way coming together. Now, with Andromeda and the Milky Way, which is going to happen in, I forget how many billion years, eight billion or four billion, I don't know. I think I think it, we don't have to worry about too much about it yet. <laughs> but when it when it happens, none of the stars are actually going to hit because there's a lot of space there. Well, it turns out it's the same thing for these guys. So the protons, we have to squeeze them and really squeeze 100 billion over 100 billion in order to get like 50 to actually go through each other. And I, I'm going to stay away from the word collide. What happens is it means that like 50 will pass through each other. Now, for most of these, they will just do that. They'll pass through each other, and it might be that the electromagnetic forces will make them scatter. They'll just sort of move in different directions. And that happens most of the time. In fact, only one in, like I, I said before, I think like one in a, a million or one in 10 million of these, that the quarks or, or the gluons that, that, that are the force particles between going between the quarks will actually come close enough to interact. When they interact, they can form, they can do something. And the standard model is actually not just the particles, but it's a set of rules which tells us how they can interact. I'll give you an example. The Higgs boson. When a Higgs boson comes into, into being, it's because a couple of the gluons from these two protons interacted. And when they interacted, they interacted through a top quark, which was a virtual top quark. Okay, it's not even one that, 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 that exists that you'll ever see. The stuff that's happening on the inside. And then boom, out of that came a Higgs boson, which will then split into a couple tops. Again, top, top, top bar. And we'll do the same sort of thing, and then they can shoot off a couple photons. So it's really kind of a strange interaction, but this is all in the standard model. So it predicts uh, how often this can happen. And then we look for that, and we try to measure that, and we can see how these these, you know, these interactions happen. And they form something else, and that other thing typically will then decay. It will transform into other particles. That's just, that will just happen. We, we call those decays, but decay is a bad word. A particle, fundamental particle, it's not made up of anything, can magically transform into another particle that's less massive plus energy. It's not like something bigger is breaking into its parts. It's that a more massive particle transforms to a lighter particle and and some energy. Alternatively, if we want to study these particles, we take some energy into a less massive particle, and then that can produce more massive particles. And that's what we're doing here at the LHC. Mm -hmm. So, I, so it's, it's a little, <laughs> we're not. CERN is populated by thousands of engineers and makers and builders and designers and applied physicists and theorists and every type of scientist you can think of, but it's also a living campus of cafeterias and dormitories and logistical staff like the public affairs person who showed me around in 2016 and 2019. When you walk around CERN, you meet so many people doing so many different things. When strangers meet each other, they tell you what they do and when they are scheduled to depart. For example, you would say like, hey, I'm Trace, I work in video I'm here till the end of the month. The reason they do this is because most of these specialists are at CERN temporarily. Maybe they're studying something specific or they're on a contract for a set amount of time from their school or their government and they're going to run out of funding eventually. The world of science might like to think of itself as an ivory tower but it's really more like people in a hotel and some of them live there and some of them visit but they all have a budget. If you want to support science 
Make sure you tell people you love it, not just your mom or your friend or your cat or your Twitter follower, but your city council members, your state legislators, your congress people, tell your scout leaders, your professoras. Tell people you value this stuff because the return on these investments isn't always tangible, but science begats more understanding and more science. There are millions of micro discoveries that come from giant science experiments like the Large Hadron Collider and its associated experiments like Atlas and LHCb and the Antimatter Factory. When CERN pushes the boundaries of what science and engineering needs to be able to do, that informs biomedical sciences, aerospace engineering, data processing and storage, and those technologies are not intangible. We end up using them every day in some cases. Crazy engineering, like learning the resonance of a particle accelerator might seem far out right now, but you'll never know what that knowledge might be used for in the future. Let me give you an example. The concept of the digital camera was invented in the 1960s at JPL. It was a way for satellites to create images without film using photoreceptors to pick up light. But before that, spy satellites would drop canisters of undeveloped film that had to be caught by planes. Seriously, it's crazy. But today, we cannot imagine a world without the digital camera. It wasn't even built till 1975 for the first time. And even then, they didn't really know what it would be for. They used cassette tapes and they only got so many photos, like 30 photos at a time. Cause like, who needs more than 30 photos? I have a hundred and some thousand photos in my camera roll digital cameras. They changed the world. And something else we cannot imagine the world without is the humble password. And while it's not as complicated as particle physics, your passwords they need some help. Humans literally cannot remember the hundreds of passwords that have to be random and secure and required for all of the different websites that we visit. Computers can crack millions of passwords in just seconds or minutes, which is why you need a password manager. Like Dashlane. Dashlane is an encrypted secure password manager that will create super secure passwords for you, store them safely, and fill them on sites you visit, whether you're on your phone, tablet, or your computer. I spent a week resetting all of my passwords all over the web and moving them all into a password manager and the feeling of cozy security, I just cannot even describe it. It's so, so, so nice to not have to remember all of those things. Ugh. Now they're all in one place, they're all different, and they're very hard to break. Dashlane also takes steps to keep you safe, alerting you if any of your accounts are affected by data breaches and has built-in VPN so you can browse safely and securely on an unsecured Wi-Fi network. Just try it. I know you're going to enjoy that sense of security that comes with having truly awesome and unique passwords. Dashlane is free to use, but for the first 200 of you who sign up for Dashlane Premium, you're going to get 10% off. Just use the code TRACE or go to dashlane.com trace to sign up. There's a link in the description. It supports your digital safety and directly supports the making of stories just like this. If we don't challenge ourselves, if we don't push ourselves to achieve what seems like unachievable goals, then what are we even doing here? What's, what's the point? What's one scientific discovery that you love that came from something completely unrelated? Let me know down in the comments. If you're subscribed and you've shared my videos with friends and you still just want to help, click over to my Patreon because I use that money to grow this channel directly. Every little bit helps. Thanks to Simon, Dustin, Jim, Steampunk, and everyone else who asked for more CERN videos when I called it out last time. I hope y'all learned something because I listened to you and I made this video, so thank you. I am Trace, thanks again for watching, and I will see you in the future. I don't know why I nodded so much, that was weird.